where we're going to pick up. First thing I'm going to pick up is my glasses. First John, before we read and discuss a part of the text, a further part of the text, uh, are there any comments or questions, any observations anybody wants to make from anything we've covered so far? Nothing. It seems like Almost every week, by the time we get to ready to end class, we get into some good discussion, and I usually say, we'll continue this next week, and then next week, I can't remember what it was we were talking about. <laughs> oh, no, I never do that, because then I might read them and be more confused. So we're 1 John chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 23 to 24, but going to take it right on down into the first part of the fourth chapter to verse 6. So would anybody like to read 3? 23 through 4, 6. I should ask that a different way. I shouldn't ask if anybody wants to read it. I'm going to say, uh, who is willing and compelled by conscience? All right, Doc, go ahead. <laughs> his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. All right. Thank you, Doc. What has been a problem that John has, has seemingly addressed? Uh, it, he, he didn't get too specific, but he called out a situation in chapter 2 that was an issue with the recipients of this letter. What had happened? Go back to chapter 2 and look at verse 26. Okay, there was, somebody was there making trouble. Somebody trying to deceive them. In verse 26, this is chapter 2, verse 26. These things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. So even as he writes this letter, there are some who were trying to deceive the recipients, deceive the recipients. He says, as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need any, for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and not a lie, and just as he, it has taught you, you abide in him. What does the anointing have to do with? The Holy Spirit. I say what, but it's really a who. Who does the anointing have to do with? When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 3, John there, the same Apostle John that's writing this letter, recorded Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. What, what did Jesus tell Nicodemus he needed to do? Born again how? By water and, and the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God is, is God. And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you need to be born of that spirit. John is, is coming down heavily on how many different ways we're born and how many we, or not how many ways, but how many ways we can tell that we are born of God. This is what those who are born of God do. This is what those who are born of God believe. So when we're looking at this here, we're seeing a problem where there were some in the church who were trying to deceive. If you back up in chapter 2 to verse 18, it says, children, it's the last hour, and just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it's the last hour. They did what? They went out from us. So these were members, people who appeared to be members, 
but they went out from them, he says. Why? They weren't of us, really. And we talked a little bit, I don't know if we talked enough, about the impact that that could have on a congregation of the Lord's people when folks leave. And they don't leave under good circumstances. It's hard enough when somebody gets a transfer or whatever, or they're moving to another part of town or another state, and, and we have a farewell to get together and send them off, and they're leaving, and part of us is gone. But when there's a fuss, when there is a split, when there's a, a schism, say that word three times real, real fast. Schism, schism, schism. I guess you could say it. What's that? Chasm. chasm. No, that's a, it makes the same thing, but schism makes a chasm, I guess. Yes, but that was the Duke, and this is the Apostle. What's that? Yeah. How's that, Billy? First Billy? Uh, uh, Corinthians 15 on through, and then First and Second and 3rd Thessalonians, where they're teaching that Christ has not risen from the dead, and some of the false teachings they were uh, bringing about to the people, and making the people wonder. We know in First, Second Thessalonians, they're, they're wondering so much about the people who died, died already that they missed the second coming, and they want to know, well, how can this be? Because our loved ones are not going to make it. If Christ should come today, at least people have already died and are concerned about that. But the false teaching there was that the dead in Christ will rise first, and we will rise second, and then be judged. Yes. So had, uh, uh, Paul had to straighten that out in First, Second Thessalonians over there, chapter three, four, five. But even in some of the teachings here, that even Christ has not raised him from the dead or risen from the dead or he's not the son of God but John is telling them we have, we're eyewitnesses of this we, we, we held him we looked up on him we beheld him we touched his hands we walked with him talked with him and we're witnesses of this and to confirm your faith and what we've been preaching to you you need to believe this and stand firm right that's how we start the letter and he's he's giving the congregation the congregation that's reading this letter are getting all these different ways that they can tell and test whether or not they are in the faith or of the faith and what applies to them individually also applies to, to other folks. Larry? Jesus is the Christ and also deny God which is in the same voice. Yes. What do they have? Right. Exactly. Now you and I would look at this and we would say, what, what do you want to be a Christian for anyway? Which is what I want to ask a lot of people who they, they want to be Christians and want to be religious but they don't want to follow anything hardly at all that's in the Bible unless it's something they agree with. But if you were the devil, if you were influencing people, what would you want them to do? Wouldn't you want people to have a spirit that would infiltrate the Lord's people and create trouble and cause dissension and cause division? What did Jesus tell us about the wheat and the tares? He said, there are tares. <laughs> and don't, don't pull all the tares up because you'll uproot the wheat in the process. What did Jesus say about false prophets? What do they look like? What do they wear? They're in sheep's clothing, but they're actually wolves. When Paul had the elders from the church at Ephesus come down to meet him at Miletus in Acts chapter 20, what did he tell the elders? He said, even from among your own selves will grievous wolves rise up and, and tear the flock. So this is the kind of thing that John is dealing with here. And I don't know if he refrained, of course the Holy Spirit's inspiring him to write as little as he's writing. I would have liked to have a lot more detail. But perhaps he's refraining because the principles God is giving us through Jesus' apostle John here apply to any false teaching that comes into the church, any heresy, any division where people leave based on something that's not of God in the first place. And so John is continually teaching the saints, you need to be loving each other. This is a hard thing to deal with. What happens to us sometimes when we're dealing with hard things? Okay, you, you grow or you fail, but sometimes when we're dealing with hard things, we get hard. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. People get mean. I tend to get mean in response. I don't want to, but it's just natural. People get ugly. 
I'm tempted to get ugly. That's, we tend to respond in kind, which is why, one of the reasons why God says, hey, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. You don't need to respond in kind. If somebody curses you, what are you supposed to do in return? Uh, Donnie says, smack him upside the head. <laughs> that would be the Christian thing to do right there. <laughs> yeah. Somebody curses us, we return a blessing. <laughs> What's that? Yes, pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless them. That's what Jesus has taught us to do. And that's what he did. What did he say of, of all the seven things on the cross? What's the one thing that stands out? Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. So John is, is impressing on the saints the need for them to stick with the original teaching of loving one another, but also sticking with the truth in the, in the, uh, in the idea of practicing righteousness. Look at, look at 229. I'm just going to run through a couple of these passages here. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who also practices righteousness is what? Born of him. That's 229. Look at 3.9. It says essentially the same thing. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What does seed do? It grows. Does, does, what's that? It reproduces after its own kind. Does it, does it do that all at once overnight? It hadn't done that with me. The seed is still growing. It, and sometimes it, with me, it's like the seed that gets in a little crack in the concrete and it's trying to thrive and press its way out, but I'm, I'm holding it back because I'm flesh. I'm, I'm, well, no, a weed is only a plant whose virtues have not yet been detected. That's, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, hey. There's something about poison. There's got to be something with poison ivy that's good. I don't know what that might be, but you can... Little lambs eat ivy. That's a good thing, I think. I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> Look at 314. We know that we've passed out of death into life. How? Because we love the brother. Don't you want to know that you've passed from death into life? We, we know ourselves, and we know that we're fleshly and wicked and evil. We do and say a lot of things. I feel like Isaiah when he was before the Lord, said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. It's like, how can I be in the presence of God? And God says, hey, I'll take care of that. Got a coal from off the fire in front of the altar and put it on Isaiah, and he was purified. And what did Isaiah say after that? Yeah, ouch. <laughs> here am I. Send me. Send me. I've been purified. That's, that's who we are. Jesus says we're the light of the world. He doesn't dwell on our faults and our failures and our weaknesses. He says, you are the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill, a hill, a hill, a city set on a hill. And go, go into all the world and do what? Don't let people know that you're a Christian because you're not strong enough and you'll reflect poorly on me. You just be a Christian in private. What did he say to do? He said, preach the gospel to the whole world. The, the reason I preach the gospel to the world, even though I am still just a man of flesh is because I know how desperately I need the gospel and if I need it that desperately, everybody else does too. So John is telling the church, here's how you can tell if you're born of God. Are you practicing the things of God? Do you believe what God has given you to believe? Chapter 3, 18 to 19. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will we'll know by this that we are of the truth. Isn't that interesting? He says, we'll know by this. He doesn't say this is a fairly good indicator. He says, we'll know by this that we're of the truth. How will we know if we're of the truth? Yes, but, but what's going to be the assurance in this text, 18 and 19? If you love with deed, in other words, you do what love would compel you to do, and you do it in truth, you're not faking it, you're not being a hypocrite. If you love in deed and in truth, then you're going to be able to assure your heart that you're of the truth because you're actually doing what the truth would compel you to do. Yeah. 
Yes. They'll recognize it. I watched a program recently about, uh, it was one of these law and order shows, and the villains uh, was a, a preacher and his wife, and they were arrogant and, and uh, self-righteous, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if everybody who was watching this program said, wait a minute, I know Christians and none of them are like that. Wouldn't that be great if we so lived before the world that the world would have no reason to blame or believe because they see our lives and they know that our lives are blessings to theirs. Do you have any neighbors that live near to you that you're glad they're your neighbors because you trust them and you can lean on them, whether they're members of the church or not? If they live after a right fashion, you're glad to have them as neighbors. Be careful how you answer this. Do you have any neighbors that you wish would move or a sinkhole would open up under their house and just <laughs> okay well you don't want a sinkhole to swallow him up because you wouldn't get paid it's like uh, Tom T. Hall anybody know who Tom T. Hall is the ballad of 40 bucks he, he, it's a song about he, he dug the grave and he's standing back away from the people who come to for the funeral and and then as he's filling in the grave, he says, this is a horrible situation because this guy owed me 40 bucks. So live in such a way that we can assure our hearts, love in deed, love in truth, John says. Look at verse 24, 324. We read it a little while ago. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him. So anybody who says, well, you really don't have to do what the Bible says as long as you believe the right thing, no. John says, keep his commandments. Do them. 4.2, we just, Doc just read it for us. By this you'll know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. How would anybody know that Jesus has come in the flesh as God if God had not somehow revealed that? He reveals it in his word. We read the text that scripture has provided and we say, I, I believe that. I accept that. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When John started his gospel in chapter 1 and verse 12, he said this. He came to his own, but those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to those who believed on his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Our adoption by God is predicated on our faith. And the only way you can have faith is if something is revealed. That's what Romans 10, 17 says. Faith comes by hearing and that by the word of Christ, or the word of God. So God reveals something to us. We believe it. That's faith. That's faith. Faith isn't blindness. is isn't uh, a leap in the dark. Faith is a leap based on what God said. 4, 7. We haven't gotten that far yet, but here's another passage just like those. Beloved, let us love one another, for love's from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. What I believe John is doing here is addressing the issues that came with whatever false teaching there had been. That people were teaching, you don't really need to do what the gospel teaches us to do. You don't really need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God come in the flesh. Uh, there's, there's better, higher, special knowledge. Billy, you had your hand up. Born of God, are we talking about being baptized, born a new, new creature in Christ? Or are we just talking about being the Spirit sent forth, created, and renewed, renewed, renewed the earth? I understand it's a person who's born of God as a child that's a Christian. It's okay. Christian. Why don't we separate any of that out? People and, I, and right. you have to make a distinction. But from John's point of view, you have to be born. John's point of view, the whole context of the gospel 
It's like when somebody goes to chapter 10 of Romans and tries to make that a case for a plan of salvation. For you would never do that if you were considering the entire context of the, the Roman letter. It's, it's not like Paul is writing this letter to the church at to lost people at Rome. He's writing it to the church at Rome who've already become saved. They are members of the church. And by the time he gets to chapter 10, he's talking about lost Israel. If you read it in context, he starts that discussion in chapter 9. And so he's talking about how, how can Israel be saved? Well, they have to believe in Jesus. And he's not saying believe in Jesus and that's all you need to do and you'll be saved. He's saying the, stating the general truth that Israel needs to believe in Christ to be saved. Yes, so, so when John is stating these things, he's not stating any of these individual things. For example, uh, verse 2. If you just took verse 2 all by itself, then all you have to do to be, uh, to be a child of God is to say, is to, is to believe that Jesus has come in the flesh. I'm sorry, verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you've heard is coming now already in the world. Uh, so don't take any single passage out of its context. Read it in its context. I believe these are, are general truths that he's stating so you can continually be identifying. For example, uh, so you've got a car and you're having... You're having problems with your tires. And you take it down to Harrington's and they put tires on it and they said, hey, you got four good tires on, you're gonna go down the road just fine. Now what have they not addressed? Muffler bearings. They haven't addressed the brakes. They haven't addressed, uh, addressed your, uh, what is it, your blinker fluid? Uh, What, what he's saying is the issue was the tires. It wasn't all this other stuff. The issue was the tires. You've got four tires. You're going to go down the road just fine. When I was, uh, when I was in the service, I worked on F-111s. If, if anybody knows what the f one they were the first plane to have swing wing, uh, really neat airplane, but they developed a problem with the 17th stage afterburner. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There. Yeah, sure, okay. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Some of those fan blades would come off and they would, they would fly out and as on their way out they would punch through a fuel cell, fuel would shoot into the engine and the thing would burn up and explode. Uh, it was a mess. So if you fix that, then you could say, now this F-111, it's going to fly just fine. Now why would they say that? They, they fix the problem, but what have they not addressed? They haven't addressed any problem that there might be with ailerons, with landing gear, with radar, with the ejection system, which works pretty good, by the way. I, I saw a couple of pilots eject out when one of these things flamed out over the runway at Nellis. It was neat. It was, yeah, it was surreal. But, but what I'm saying is you fix that problem, and, and everybody knows in the context that's what you're talking about. You're talking about the tires. You're talking about the engine. You're not talking about everything. So when John says, those who love are born of God, he's not saying, just go out into the world and anybody you, you see who loves somebody else, that person is born of God and they never need to do anything else. They don't need to repent. They don't need to confess. They don't even need to believe in Jesus because if you, if you love, well, a lot of people love that don't have any knowledge of Christ at all. What, what he's saying is, in the context of what he's talking about, here's how you can tell what's right. And, in some cases, what's wrong. Or the people who manufactured the blades. Well, they do that, I know. It's one of the reasons I got out, because fix and blame is what they do best. Well, they do it the worst, actually, but that's what they're specializing. I'm going to get off on that. Uh, verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5. John says of the folks who do not confess Christ has come in the flesh that they are from the world. 
Therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. Anytime you are becoming popular with the world, you need to step back and take a look at what you're living and what you're saying. Because the world typically is the automatic enemy of God. And so when we, and, and it's, not, it's not bad when people accept you. That, there's a place for that too. Uh, Proverbs even says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to accept him. So there's a context for that. I'm just saying be careful when you get too much acclaim from the world. Yes. The Arabs back in the 1800s, right in that era, they was fighting the Jews. But the only person that had privilege to go through the lines and don't molest them was the merchant, the Jewish merchant, because the Jewish merchant was absolutely honest. They knew they was going to get their product for their price and turn around and bring back the product back into uh, the Jewish land. They were not bothered. They had free freedom to reign of going where they want in the Muslim land. Yes, ever and more. Any, any observations about any of this text we've, we've read so far or any, anything we've been talking about? All right, verse 7. Let's start at verse 7 and read down through 14. Who will read that? Got a reader? Okay, Carolyn. 7 through 14. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. How far? 14. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that dwell in him, he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Thank you, Carolyn. How did John say just in chapter 3 how we're supposed to love? Two ways. Two ways we're supposed to love according to John in chapter 3. And we just talked about it a little bit ago. Not, not just in, in word or tongue, in deed and truth, yes. But I'm glad you said that because that's the contrast. If you're only loving in word or in tongue, if you're just talking about it and saying it, that's, that's not real love. Deed and truth, that's the contrast. That's how we're supposed to love. So when he says, let us love one another... Because love's from God, and everyone who loves is born of God. He's saying love, how? In deed and in truth. What do, people, what do people need? I heard this years ago, and it stuck with me because it just rings so true. People with good minds, thinking right, talk about ideas. People with... What's the word? Average minds talk about things. People with small minds, what do they talk about? People. Okay, so you've heard this before. Some of you have. I, I think it rings pretty much true. Small-minded people, those are the ones you're going to find gossiping. You don't find people with, with godly, outgoing, large-thinking, out-of-the-box type minds sitting around talking about people. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that it's absolute in every situation. All of us will from time to time, catch ourselves talking about things we shouldn't be talking about. And maybe giving somebody down the road that doesn't need to be given down the road. But, but by and large, what John is talking about is being the kind of people who really are salt and really are light. 
and really our cities sit on a hill. You can think about people in your own life that are these things to you. They mean something to you, not because they just say nice stuff every now and then, but because they really are an encouragement to you or they do something for you. They are, they're generous with their stuff or they're generous with their kindness. They're generous with, with information, not in a way that they're trying to dominate you by t showing you how smart they are, but, but they've got information they want you to have because they think it'll better your life. Donnie? Genuine in their love. That's what he's talking about. How many times has he talked about love so far? I'm not asking for an exact number, but a bunch, right? A bunch. <laughs> it, it's like John, it's almost like he's, he's thinking that's, that's like the second greatest commandment or something. To love your neighbor as yourself. All right. I mean, right. And he, 46, he talks about the world about half that many times. I think it's 22 times. So he, he's bringing up this contrast, but this is the way the world is. But you love, you love, you be a, 23 times. Okay. You've been taking notes? <laughs> but he is talking about, about really love. Remember the conversation that Jesus had with Peter in the end of John's gospel? By the way, who was there to hear all this take place? John was there. John the apostle was there. And Peter had denied Jesus how many times? Three times. So Jesus says to Peter when he sees him there, he says, uh, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? What's Peter say? I phileo you. It's a different kind of love. It, it's like the warm affection, but it's not agape. Agape is the real serious love that we deliberately do. So apparently Peter didn't feel like he could say he agaped Jesus because it wasn't, he, he didn't feel worthy of that apparently. Now, that's not what John says specifically, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this is the way it was. What did Jesus tell Peter after Peter said he phileoed? He had a warm sense of affection for Jesus. What did Jesus tell him? Feed my sheep. A second time, Jesus asks, Peter, do you agape me? What did Peter say? Lord, I phileo you. I have a warm sense of affection for you. This is the second time he's had the same question put to him. This is the second time he's answered phileo. What does, Peter, what does Jesus tell Peter after he answers it the second time? Go feed my sheep. What's he giving Peter the opportunity to do? He didn't want Peter to lie. Knew what he was pushing him into. Peter already knew that Jesus knew the answer to that, and he didn't want because history. Well, Jesus, was, get, Jesus okay. was giving him a chance to. He had uh, denied him three times, he's giving him a chance to. Yeah. Agape. That, that's, that's what, what I, I think he's giving him a chance to redeem himself, Don. Him yes. Yeah. 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 Did you agape me? Well, I didn't agape you. I didn't follow you. I, but I have a warm sense of affection for you. And he keeps saying, do you agape me? Feed my sheep. And he's saying, here, here's the chance to agape me. Exactly. Go do this and you agape me now. You, know, right. you, feel, you feel love for me, but now you have a chance to do love. You know, the verb love, so to speak. Right. right. And so the third time Jesus asks, because he asked the question a third time, but the third time he doesn't say agape. He, he comes down to Peter's level. He's, Peter. Do you phileo me? Peter said, I phileo you, Lord. What did he tell him to do that time? Feed my sheep. Same thing. Same thing. So John, hearing all this, is now writing this letter to the church. And he says, let's love one another, brother, for love's of God. How do we love one another? In deed and in truth. You do it. You don't love by word or tongue. You love in deed and in truth. That's what John is saying. So they've had this, this whole big issue of 
false teachers coming in and false teachers leaving and they went out of them or went out from them because they were not of them and and John's not saying now here's how you defend yourself against false teachers from now on this is what you do John is saying love each other this is the best defense against false teaching if there's just so much love among you that this kind of thing it, you're going to know when it's when it comes in if you've got clear water Are you going to be more aware of when it gets contaminated than if you've got murky water? Yeah, sure. Duh. Milk. How much chocolate syrup do you have to put in milk to change the color? Just a drop. So if you've got a congregation of people that are loving each other with the love of Christ, when somebody comes into that congregation that that's not going to do that, you're going to know it. And something's going to have to give. Either the church will have to start to change and become more like that individual, or that individual is going to have to change and become more like them, or they're going to have to leave. It does the church. I know. After it became... Romanized. Well, well to, to some degree, degree it did die out, but in other places it was wiped out. Uh, with the rise of Islam in later centuries. But the gospel is the seed. And everywhere the seed is spread, truth springs up. I'm convinced you know, we look back on the record of history and we think we know everything. Well, no, we don't. I don't even know what my grandparents uh, I know a few things about them. And that's just recent history. Why, why don't we know all that stuff? Because it wasn't all written down. The, my grandpa did not have a secretary following him around, writing down everything he did. A lot of things just don't get recorded. So I, I think there have been congregations of the church through the centuries who've, who've risen and then, I don't want to say dissipated, but, but they've ceased to be in existence. What's one thing that all the congregations in the New Testament have in common? None of them are there anymore. Not a single, they're not there. Now the people might have come back and reestablished the church, re-preached the gospel and reestablished the church in some of those places, but none of those original congregations remain. Isn't that interesting? And yet the church remains. I find it interesting that, that this the church is so strong in the United States, but where, where also is the church being strengthened and growing today? Africa, where else? India, China, Ukraine. The, the gospel's being preached and congregations are being established. We don't even know about them. We don't need to know about them. We don't have to know about them. In the Revelation, when, when uh, John is talking about the 144,000, that's 12,000 from each tribe. But after he, he tells us about the 144,000, who else does he say he sees? Now, that's chapter 6. I've, I've moved on from chapter 6, Billy. You're behind. <laughs> he says he sees a multitude without number from every tribe, every people, every nation. The gospel has gone out from Jerusalem in A.D. 33 and people are hearing it and believing it and becoming Christians, and they've been doing that for all time, and nothing's going to stop it. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to establish my church. The gates of hell aren't going to stop it. The gates of death aren't going to stop it. It's going to keep on moving on. And so even though a congregation may cease to exist, the gospel's still moving on, and, and this is what we need to do if we're going to be part of that gospel. James, proselytized down in India. And down in India, they only had it one book, the Book of James. They didn't have the rest of them when they were put together by the Catholic Church. So the Catholics went down there and attacked them to destroy their religion because they only had one book. The question is, if you only had one book, from the time that Christ, that Christ was there, 
for all the people that only had this one book and took to heaven. Just because they only had this one book and the rest of them they didn't have. Well, the book is one thing, but probably up until the time of Moses, the Word of God had been passed word of mouth. Or, uh, people passed on information verbally. They had well, yeah, the stories and things they told. They only had one book. Right. But what I'm saying is, in India, if you go down there and preach, because how long did it take for there to actually be a New Testament after the New Testament church was established? Did they have a New Testament on Pentecost? Now be careful how you answer. <laughs> they, they didn't have this. But the New Testament had been established in Jesus' blood, and that was wrapped up in the gospel. When the gospel was preached, what they preached was the New Testament or the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. What we have in print is the New Covenant in print, but the covenant exists even without the printed page. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. Yes. With the gospel, through the gospel. It's the same gospel. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And that that was the preaching of the gospel. Get done or there. You know, we don't need to make those decisions. Let's not argue about that. Let's just say, God, let God have his mercy. Let's just preach the gospel and show them how to get their conscience clean. Right. And, and when Jesus, Jesus gave us the Great Commission, he didn't say, take your New Testaments and go into all the world. Because they didn't have that. He said, you go preach the gospel. How simple is the gospel message? Jesus, the Son of God, came. He died for our sins. He was uh, buried and, and resurrected the third day. And so you need to put your faith in him and let somebody baptize you in water and rise to walk in newness of life that's and you'll be forgiven of your sin that's the gospel in a nutshell that's how peter or paul defined it in in corinthians and when they went forth that's what they had they didn't have a, a book a new testament now if in the olden days if you were going to buy a horse you'd make a deal with the guy and it was probably going to be verbal you'd make a deal you'd shake hands was there a contract there was a contract. Where was it? It was in the minds of the contractors. Now, just because it wasn't written out doesn't make it any less of a contract. That's how we need to think of the New Testament. The New Testament is the, the covenant that God has given us through his son Jesus. And if you don't have it on the printed page, you've still got it. You've still got it. The New Testament, thank God, is something we have as a tool so that we can go and teach people this, this is what it actually says. I'm not just making this up. This is what it says. And what we have that's here agrees with what we were given through the Jews. It's, this, it's the same word of God, just two different covenants. But it's a, it's a covenant. And you preach it to people. They obey it. They don't have to know everything, thank God. All we have to know is the gospel. Don? In our own hearts, we tend to start living by a works basis, because I think we do that by agree. I think that's why the Bible's full of this stuff on works and, and faith and all of that, because it, it's, it's easy for us to get caught up in a works basis. If we start doubting our salvation because we're not good enough, if we, start, we should be alerting ourselves. What am I doing? What is my motive for doing good? Is it because I'm trying to be, oh, I'm, I'm kind of going to a works. When we confess that to God, and man, our conscience gets clear. And it, it, even if we're trying to work our way, 
God, you know I'm doing this because I'm just trying to be good enough. And man, instantly my faith kicks back in. I'm trusting in Christ crucified again. I mean, anything that we struggle with with that, whether we're trying to work our way to heaven, whether we're putting too much faith and we're kind of lax, man, we just go back and talk to God, and now we're putting our trust back in Christ crucified. And our conscience is clear, and it makes, our, it makes it so much easier to live than trying to all of a sudden move into the workspace. It's all of a sudden going into the, I can do anything I want basis. You know? mm -hmm. We're always talking to God, whichever direction we're going. And once we talk to God and walk with God on a constant basis, man, we're constantly cleansed. We're constantly, you know, that's why we want to talk to Him all the time about everything. You know, just to, to walk in Him and be with Him all the time. Right. And, and so we're not turning this baptism thing into a loss, so to speak. We're talking about this. And I'm not negating it by any stretch. No, no. I'm just talking about our freedom and our relaxing and being able to lay your head down at night and go to sleep because you've gone one way or the other, you know. I don't know. I don't know what happened here. Well, it, it's a whole package. We, we tend to break everything down. We try to and say, what about this, what about that? But it's a whole package. You, you go out and buy a car, you're going to find one that's got stuff, and you're going to have to pick one that doesn't have everything.